Um, yes, I am. Uh, I'm Jenny Butterworth. Um, I facilitate the Historic Environment Trailblazer, which is a group that is developing heritage apprenticeships. Um, the role is funded by Historic England. Um, and I'm just going to do a really short introduction to heritage apprenticeships, where we've got to. And really, I don't have a, an outcome or an output. It's really, I will just end with some questions. Um, okay, so, um, basically, in 2015, following a sort of review of apprenticeships, the government instituted a programme to develop new apprenticeships across all sectors. Um, uh, I think it's fair to say ambitious target was set of three million new apprenticeships starts by 2020. Public sector organisations um, have a target to reach a 2.3% uh, apprenticeship workforce by 2020. And um, large employers in the heritage sector as well as elsewhere, which is employers with a wage bill of more than three million pounds, since April 2017 have been paying a levy of 0.5%. It's a tax which goes into a central fund which <coughs> employers can draw back down to fund the training for apprenticeships and as part of that financial model small and medium sized employers can draw down a subsidy. Um, under the new system apprenticeship is a protected term and it must include a contract of employment that's at least 12 months long, it can be longer, it must include 20% off the job training um, and then a programme of on the job training and assessment, mentoring and so on. The important thing probably that is different to some previous schemes like say the MVQ is that the sort of on programme assessment is part of the process but there is a crucial moment where the apprentice reads what's called the gateway and then it is all done through an end point assessment, the completion of the apprenticeship. So what this means is that any individual apprenticeship involves several partners, there is the apprentice themselves, there is their employer, there is a training provider and there is an endpoint assessment organisation. Um, I should also just say at this point that apprenticeships are a devolved policy. So what I'm talking about is how all UK employers of that size pay the levy, but the arrangements for executing um, apprenticeships are different in each of the regions. What I'm talking about is uh, England. So the Historic Environment Trailblazer has been going for more years than I have facilitated it. Um, it is a group of employers. Um, I've put some of them on this slide. I don't think that's actually everybody. They are supported by professional bodies and other organisations, training providers, um, and they're drawn from all sorts of areas in the sector. Um, and as you can see, it's split into three working groups which cover three different sector areas. Uh, Historic England, as well as being a public sector employer, um, and having a target and being a levy payer, they also have a white paper commitment to support the development of apprenticeships, which is why they chair the group and they fund my role. <coughs> the uh, Trailblazer works with the Institute for Apprenticeships, which is part of the Department for Education. Um, the working groups meet every four to six weeks. It's a significant investment by the organisations involved in developing these apprenticeships. They are employer driven, so the employers get to decide which roles they think the sector needs and develop them and then put them through the approvals process. Um, it's a several stage um, <coughs> process. This is the Institute website. You, there's a database on there you can search and you can see which ones are in development and which ones are ready for delivery. As part of the process, there is sector consultation, and for each apprenticeship, a funding band is set, which is the maximum amount that can be drawn down to fund the training of the apprentice. So the Historic Environment Trailblazer <coughs> is developing six apprenticeships currently, um, two in each sector area. As you can see, I think a lot of people think of apprenticeships as being an entry level thing for junior people wanting to join a profession, but these, they exist at all levels. I think there might be one or two, I'm not sure about that, but certainly in our sector, three up to seven. Three is a uh, A-level equivalent, seven is a postgraduate master's degree. So um, I think the, the thing here is the aim is, is various. The aim is firstly to develop entry level roles, to develop alternative routes into the profession, to increase social mobility, diversity, capture new audiences into our professions. 
But there is also, with the senior um, uh, roles, the sense that these can be used for upskilling, that this is something you, I mean, in theory, you could take on an 18 year old and you could put them through an entire postgraduate apprenticeship, but I think that's probably unlikely. It's more likely that employers can use this as part of the professional development of their staff, um, and that's the hope. And I think for our sector, the other hope is that these apprenticeships can be used to address <coughs> skills shortages, personnel shortages, um, you know, some of which already exist, and some, as Mike was saying yesterday in his talk, are, are approaching. So this I just picked out some ones that I think are particularly relevant to the museum sector. The three highlighted ones are the three that the Historic Environment Trailblazer are developing. There are two conservation ones, again an entry level and a senior one. The Archaeological Specialist <coughs> 7, which I'm going to talk a bit more about in a minute. There are other trailblazers developing other apprenticeships. Yeah, I looked it up and the lead for the curator one is a, somebody at the National Trust. So. There are the Museum Gallery Tech, which I think is actually quite similar to the Camp Conservation Tech. I think the V&A will probably deliver both registrar. There are also a whole string of others which are not specific to our sector, but are applicable. And I know lots of lo the local authorities that you all work for, and indeed Historic England, are to up the, their apprenticeship targets. They, they have taken on apprentices in these more generic roles. Each apprenticeship is, um, it has an occupational profile. This is the Archaeological Specialist Level 7. Um, uh, we did, we have to consult, and we did consult SMA members back in the summer, you might remember that. It's a postgraduate apprenticeship. It involves a master's qualification. It is a very broad standard. Um, this has to be so for practical reasons to do with the way the um, institute works and also to make them financially viable. It isn't possible to say develop a postgraduate apprenticeship in Roman's fine specialisms because there wouldn't be enough to make it sustainable. So it is really broad and you can see from the range of job titles there um, it can capture a lot of specialisms. And then each apprenticeship is um, is defined by a set of duties and a set of knowledge, skills and behaviours that, um, that somebody has to become competent at at the level of which the apprenticeship is set to complete it. And a lot of this, these apprenticeships have been done by harvesting job descriptions and talking to the professional bodies about their competencies and matching those things up to create these standards. And that, that's really where I come to an end. Hopefully quite, I've done that quite quickly, that's good. Um, this the, it isn't a story with an ending yet. These, the, all of our heritage sector apprenticeships will be ready for delivery sort of between the next couple of months and September 2019. And we know that we're not quite ready there for them yet in terms of sector readiness. I think their usefulness will depend on the take up in the sector and there is more promotion that needs to be done to make people aware of apprenticeships and how they work and how the funding can be drawn down and so on. Some are easier to imagine than others. The Archaeological Technician Level 3, um, which is an entry fieldwork role. We know there are quite a lot of the larger commercial employers who are interested in that. Um, same with the Conservation Technician, the VNA is ready to deliver it. <coughs> with the Archaeological Specialist, I think that's the one that I feel is interesting and could do with SMA attention, really. It may not be that museums are employers who wish to employ apprentices in that role, though I think it might be useful thinking about FLOs and upskilling and side skilling and so on. But when we know that, again, commercial employers probably will use it for upskilling, I think the last few days we've talked a lot about skills shortages, loss of expertise, new ways of delivering training and accessing collections. And really, I think my concluding thought is that this, this apprenticeship doesn't solve any of those things, obviously, but what it does do is provide a new arena in which 
employers, museums, universities, because they will be, this will be delivered by universities, and collections can be brought together in a slightly different way because the, the emphasis on the funding and how the different partners interact through individuals can be different, but it does need further work, I think, to work out how that might benefit the sector more generally. <coughs> and just to say, there are uh, always lots of questions about how the apprentices work in functional fashion and do um, email me if you want more information or there's quite a lot of information on the industry.